that career? It, it's incredibly important. And first of all, I love my freedom. We all love our freedom. But I more importantly love your freedom. You see, that's the difference because everybody wants to have their own freedom, but our founders had this idea that freedom belongs to all of us because it's been given to us by God and the role of the government is to defend that freedom. But freedom has been under attack from the very, very beginning, not only of this nation, but the beginning of the world. We've always heard the term, freedom is not free. We think of, yeah, it wasn't free. We think of the battles, the wars that we've been through fighting uh, for freedom. But freedom is a battle that we have to fight every day of the week and every week of the year continually. It's always a, an attack on our freedom. There, there is a, there's an illustration here with us tonight that freedom is not free. So two gentlemen in uniform standing back there because if freedom was free, we wouldn't need those great law enforcement officers here tonight. How about a hand for our For their advantage is why we need great law enforcement officers. They're on the front line every day of defending freedom. Now, every year in July, we celebrate an important historical moment in our nation, Independence Day. Now, I want you to understand that there's a significant difference between independence and freedom. Okay? Second Continental Congress they passed this, this important measure that declared that we were independent from England. And I want you to understand this. We gained our independence because they declared it. They said we are now free and independent nation. It was done. That was it. They declared it. But we earned our freedom because they fought for it. See, there's a big difference there. You can declare something and it is done. But if you actually want to reap the benefits, you have to fight for it. And they did for eight long years, they fought for it. And I want you to understand this, fighting for freedom, standing for truth, takes a lot of courage because it is not easy. When you think about the darkest period in American history, at that time was Valley Forge. You see, we lost more battles in the American Revolution than we won. But these men were so dedicated to this concept of freedom, they were persistent and they kept coming back and they kept coming back. And one of the British generals said, these are the most frustrating people I ever met in my life. We meet them on the battlefield, they beat them, they come back and fight again. We meet them, they come back and fight again, they keep coming back. Do we have that fortitude today? Mm. Thomas Paine described that situation because it was clear. Washington was under a lot of pressure at that point because the British held all the major economic centers in the nation. The British were in Philadelphia in the war. They were in Charleston. They were in New York. Washington has his troops in the middle of a forest in the freezing cold. One road, it's easy to find where the American patriots are. All you have to do is follow the bloody footsteps in the snow because they didn't have shoes. See, it was a very, very dark period. And there had to be a lot of pressure to just give up and let's negotiate. In fact, Thomas Paine said, heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so a celestial article as freedom should not be highly rated. Basically what he's saying, the greater the prize, the harder the conflict. The greater the prize, the harder the conflict. I, I've learned that through my life. My dad used to tell me, so son, if there's something in life that you don't like, you've got two choices. You can do something to change the situation or just accept the status quo and go on with your life. But complaining never fixes anything. Now, he was a medic in World War II, from D-Day to the Battle of the Bulge on end of turn. He knew what conflict was. 
He knew how important freedom was. I don't know if you guys remember, but last year, which seems like decades ago, I don't know if you noticed, we had a little conflict going on in 2020. Yeah. Things a little unusual. Yeah. Nothing as bad as what these folks in the past have faced, by the way. Uh, we've been doing several events uh, with these guys. They're from Texas. They're proud to be from Texas. I lived in Texas for a while, right? And so uh, they know where I'm going with this. They know where I'm going with this. I went out to Dallas a couple of weeks ago speaking to David. Uh, <laughs> you, you're in Georgia now. You're in free America. I go to Texas to speak at their conference. They make you wear masks in Texas. Oh, no. Oh, no. We don't. Can we just make a note that if Greg Abbott runs for president, do not support him here in Georgia if he ever does that after the terrible job he's done with making Barry wear masks when he gets yeah. So we've had a little bit of fun with that because for years I've, I've, I've put up with the Texas thing, right? So <laughs> Texas is big, okay. Last year, some in the House of Representatives didn't like how our president was standing for truth and exposing truth. So they decided to impeach him on made up charges. So I'm, I'm there and I've been given, because not everyone was given a chance to speak. And I knew there were some who were going to vote against impeachment. I had talked against impeachment. I wasn't, I was actually one of the committees that was charged with hearing impeachment. Well, we never had a single hearing. Interesting, huh? So I was given two minutes to speak. And I prayed that night, like, Lord, this is probably the most two minute, important two minutes I've ever had in my life. I need to say something to expose how corrupt this whole system of impeachment has been and how it has violated every precept of our Constitution. Many others were saying the same thing. Something David had brought up earlier. You know, the Bible gives us insight to every part of our lives. Why would it be any different when you're talking about a judicial system or an impeachment that you don't go to the Bible to look for truth? I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I knew exactly what I had to say. But I wasn't prepared for it. was the backlash I was going to get. I actually have some staff here that had to answer the phones after that. And so they wish at the time I would never do another speech like this. If Brad, those of you who weren't offended by Brad Stein, you may get offended at this moment. Madam Speaker, I rise today in opposition not only to these articles of impeachment, but in strong opposition to the process that has brought us to this point. Our Constitution and Bill of Rights are all about process. Our founders knew that a government without constraints could accuse anyone of any crime at any time, even without compelling evidence. That's why the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments established a bedrock principle of innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But on November the 14th, Speaker Pelosi informed the press that the President should prove his innocence when she stated, Mr. President, if you have anything that shows your incident, in innocence, then he should make that known. The Constitution also guarantees that the accused can call witnesses to testify on their behalf, but the Republicans and the President were continually denied that right throughout this process. The Sixth Amendment guarantees the right of the defendant to face their accuser, but not only have the Democrats prohibited Republicans and the President from questioning the so-called whistleblower, his identity has been kept secret. Before you take this historic vote today, one week before Christmas, I want you to keep this in mind. When Jesus was falsely accused of treason, Pontius Pilate gave Jesus the opportunity to face his accusers. During that sham trial, Pontius Pilate afforded more rights to Jesus than the Democrats have afforded this president in this process. Everything from the most 
vile language that you could ever imagine to death for us. And, and I'm wondering, what is it about that? All it was tell the truth. I even had conservative talk show hosts arguing the point that you shouldn't use the Bible in politics. Well, if you're not going to use it, no, you're going to use it. I believe you use it for every aspect of your life, especially when it comes to right and wrong. But then it dawned on me. It wasn't what I said. It was a particular word I said there. Jesus. That's right. That's what triggered this. Even some liberal pastors were writing articles about me comparing Trump to Jesus. I didn't compare Trump to Jesus. I compared the Democrats to Pontius Pilate. There's a whole difference. <laughs> Here's one. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Yep. You see, I converge the spiritual with the political, and you are not supposed to do that here because that's pretty convicting that you could offend some people doing that. Mm. Well, you know, after I thought about it, I thought about what the rest of the scripture says. You know, when you're under attack, you put on the whole armor of God. That's right. And you stand. That's right. And after you do everything to stand, you take a break, you take a knee, and you give up. No. What does it say? After doing everything to stand, stand. stand. You continue to stand, even in the darkest hours. That's where the courage comes in, is to be able to stand for the truth and fight for the truth. My dad, a medic, landed on the beaches of Normandy during D-Day. I was honored to be part of the official U.S. delegation to travel to Normandy for the 75th anniversary of D-Day as a veteran and since my dad was there. As I'm sitting there at the American Cemetery, President Trump comes on the stage and he goes to this elderly gentleman up on the stage and he's you know, typical Trump. This is a tough guy right here. He's a tough guy. This is a real hero. It turned out that this guy was about 17 or 18 years old when he stormed the beaches of Normandy. The death rate of his unit was 96%. The death rate of COVID is 0.001%, and we have young people that won't go to the store. to be fearful except for a respectful fear of the power of God. Amen. Correct? Yes. What can you do? You've got to be able to stand. That's what this whole thing is about, is equipping you. And I want you to understand, we could go through story after story after story of Washington and Valley Forge. We could go through uh, General McAuliffe refusing to, to surrender during the Battle of the Bulge. Most of these are officers, people that you've heard about or you read about in history, but there's one that you probably haven't heard about, and this it's Private Martin. Now, nobody actually has a picture of Private Martin. This is someone who was in the 82nd Airborne during the Battle of the Bulge. You see, when the, the Germans broke through the secret line in December of 1944, we thought the war was pretty much over. After landing in Normandy on D-Day, the Allies pushed through Europe, ended up pushing the Germans back across the line, but it was, it was winter. France, it was raining in, in the Ardennes forest, in Holland, it was snowing, and we couldn't really operate there. So what we did is we brought our battle-hardened troops back, and we put some of the fresh troops up on the line, and Hitler took advantage of it. He secretly brought in tanks and artillery, using the, the weather to mask it. And on December the 18th, he broke through the secret line and started moving very rapidly through the Ardennes, decimating our troops. We started retreating. The GIs called it the Great Bug Out. The 101st Airborne was mobilized and was sent to Bastogne. The 82nd Airborne was sent to St. Fifth because that was, we got enough intelligence to know those were the two targets of the entire German force. Their orders were to hold those towns at all costs. There was a, a 
basically a tank. It was a tank destroyer that was retreating, trying to get to St. Biff, to get behind our lines where the strength was. As he was driving down these, these gravel roads in the middle of the snow, several GIs just started jumping on the tanks because we're in a mass retreat. We have this overwhelming force coming at us. So this, this tank commander is, is driving down the road with all these GIs hanging off the tank, and he gets up and he sees this guy that looks like this, battle-weary, unshaven, dirty. You can tell he's seen a lot of combat, and he's just casually dealing, digging a foxhole along the side of the road, just out there by himself. So they stop the tank. Sergeant opens the hatch, and he says, Private, is this the way to the rear? Private casually looks at him and he says, Sir, are you looking for somewhere safe? He said, Yes, we are. He said, Well, then pull that tank behind me. I may be second airborne. This is as far as the Germans are going to get. <laughs> this was actually a recruiting poster for the 82nd Airborne during Vietnam. You see, this is one of the unsung heroes. But I want you to think about it. Here's this lone private who was given orders to stop the Germans. Surrender wasn't in his vocabulary because he was fighting for something greater than himself. Your freedom. He wasn't going to have any if he gave his life for your freedom. But he was so dedicated to that cause, he was willing to take on the entire German army with nothing but his, his M1 carbine. The tank commander happened to be the son of comedian Will Rogers. Some of you know who I'm talking about. His name was Bill Rogers. Probably had no idea who that celebrity was driving the tank, but when Bill Rogers heard what, the, what he told the sergeant, what Private Martin told the sergeant, he hollered to his men, Get off this tank, here's where we're going to make our stand. A troop carrier truck came down the road and heard this, they heard the story of Private Martin, and they said, this is where we're going to make our stand. You see, courage is contagious. That point became the stronghold of which the Germans never advanced beyond because of the courage of one man. You are... It's going to take courage. You're going to be under attack. But you all individuals can be private parts. You can make a difference, not just now, but in the future. Because freedom is worth defending, and it's not free. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. You're going to be under attack. But the Bible tells us that joy, to take joy in our tribulations, because they teach you to be faithful, and they equip you to go through more tribulations. And are you afraid of what somebody's going to say about you? Well, that's good, because the Bible says, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. You want to be happy and blessed? Stand for truth, stand for courage, and you will. I believe in America. I believe in the biblical principles it stands upon. And I believe we can and we will win our freedom if we stand together and we'll preserve it for future generations. God bless you all.